Our goal is to prove the Lindbergh-Feller central limit theorem. Let's remember exactly what that is. The setting is what we called a standard triangular array. We have, for each n, a row of n random variables, x, n, k, k ranging from 1 up to n, that are independent along the row, L2, centered, and whose variances along the row sum up to 1. That's how we normalize them. That means that the variance of the sum is 1, since they are independent. We'd like to show that the sum of the nth row converges in distribution to a standard normal. That's how the standardizations have been set up. But that's not true in this general setting, because we could, for example, have almost all of the variance concentrated in just one of the terms, for example, and then it would have an outsized contribution to the general distribution of the sum. So we need to have a condition that says, roughly speaking, all of the variables are about the same size. No one dominates the sum. And there are two conditions that we considered. A sort of natural one that came out of classical central limit theorem calculations is that it should be that the maximum of the variance of any element along each row should tend to zero. And then a slightly stronger condition than that, the Lindbergh condition, was this concentration condition here, which, as we saw last time, implies the decaying variance condition. The Lindbergh-Feller central limit theorem has two parts, which we stated as a kind of if and only if last time, but let's state it as two separate parts this time. The Lindbergh central limit theorem, which is what Lindbergh originally proved, states that if this condition, the Lindbergh condition, holds for the standard triangular array, then the sum of the nth row does converge weakly to a standard normal random variable. Now, it's natural to wonder whether this Lindbergh condition is the best possible, and the answer is pretty close. Because of the second half of the Lindbergh-Feller CLT, this part due to Feller, and why his name is attached to it as well, if the sum of the nth row converges to a normal, and if the array satisfies the decaying variance condition, then it actually satisfies the Lindbergh condition. So while that doesn't show us that the Lindbergh condition is the best possible, it does mean that the decaying variance condition alone can't do the trick. Because if it could do the trick, then the Lindbergh condition would have to hold as well. We're now going to prove the Lindbergh central limit theorem, that when the Lindbergh condition holds, the central limit theorem holds. We will not prove the partial converse due to Feller, although the techniques are similar using basically some intricate calculus estimates for characteristic functions. I'd rather not spend the time going through the extra details for that, but if you're interested, you can see all the details in driver's notes, section 30.2. We're going to need two very simple lemmas in the calculations to prove Lindbergh's theorem. The first is the following inequality, quantifying continuity of large products. If a1, b1, through an, bn are all complex numbers of modulus less than or equal to 1, so all in the unit disk, then the difference between the product of the a's and the product of the b's in modulus is less than or equal to the sum of the distances between the a's and the b's. And proving that is a simple induction argument. The base case when n equals 1 we actually get an equality, so that's clear. And now, for the n case, we write the product of the n terms as the product of the first n minus 1 times the last one, and look at that difference. And now we do the usual thing, breaking up with a term in the middle added and subtracted. Now using the triangle inequality and collecting like terms, now a n is assumed to be less than or equal to 1 in absolute value, and b, the product of n minus 1 terms that are all less than or equal to 1, is less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. And so this is less than or equal to the modulus of a minus b plus the modulus of a n minus b n. And now, by the inductive hypothesis, that first term is less than or equal to the sum of aj minus bj in modulus up to n minus 1. And then adding back in this last term is exactly the conclusion that we wanted to reach. And so we've finish the proof by induction.
The second lemma that we'll need is just an application of Taylor's theorem to second order. If x is an L2 random variable, then the characteristic function of x, when compared to this quadratic function, which is just the second order Taylor expansion of that same function, is bounded in modulus by xi squared times epsilon of xi, where epsilon of xi is this quantity here. The expected value of the minimum of x squared and x cubed over 3 factorial times the modulus of xi. And that term goes to 0 as xi goes to 0. Now the fact that that term goes to 0 as xi goes to 0 is a simple application of the dominated convergence theorem. The integrand in here is less than or equal to this uniform dominating function x squared, which is L1 because x is in L2. But because we're talking about the minimum of these two, it's also less than or equal to this, which is, of course, pointwise going to zero as c goes to zero. And therefore, by dominated convergence theorem, the expected value also goes to zero. Now, proving this is really just Taylor's theorem with remainder, expanding the Taylor expansion of this function to second order. The difference is less than or equal to the absolute value of the next term in the Taylor series. But at the same time, we could use the triangle inequality to break off this term by itself. And so this is also less than or equal to that. But now using Taylor's theorem with remainder applied to the first order part of the expansion of e to the i t, that first part is also less than or equal to 1 half t squared. And so we see that for every t, this quantity is less than or equal to that, but also less than or equal to that. Therefore, it's less than or equal to the minimum of those two. Now, apply that with t equal to xx pointwise, and take the expected value. The quantity that we're interested in up here is the absolute value of the expected value of the inside, which by the triangle inequality for integrals is less than or equal to this, which is therefore less than or equal to that, which is indeed this quantity here, concluding the proof. Okay, now to prove Lindbergh's central limit theorem. Using the continuity theorem, as we did with the basic central limit theorem, we're going to show that the characteristic function of the sum of the nth row converges to the characteristic function of a standard normal. Now, Sn is the sum of n independent terms, and therefore the characteristic function is the product. To use that first lemma, which bounds a difference of two products of n things, we'd like to express e to the minus c squared over 2 as a product. And we can do that because of our normalization that the variance is sum to 1. So we can decompose e to the minus c squared over 2 like this. And thus, we're going to compare this to this using lemma 1 to bound the difference by the sum of the difference between the characteristic function of x and k and the characteristic function of this normal with that variance. Now that might look strange because we don't have a sum anymore, and why should this xnk, which could have any distribution we want, have characteristic function that can be nicely compared to a Gaussian's? The reason is not that xnk is close to Gaussian, but that the variance is small in both cases, and small enough to control the difference in the sum. Motivated by lemma 2, let's look at the Taylor expansion of this. We know that it's approximately equal to its second order expansion. The lemma tells us precisely how to estimate it, and we'll use that in a moment, but just to motivate where we're going, notice that we've centered the random variables, so that's zero, and this is sigma and k squared, and so we're approximating to second order the Taylor polynomial of this function. So now let's get down to details using lemma two in order to control this approximation. This term in the sum will break up by first comparing the characteristic function of xnk to the second order Taylor expansion of it, and then comparing that second order Taylor expansion to that function there. So we see now that to show convergence of the characteristic function to the characteristic function of a Gaussian, we need to show that the sum of these terms plus the sum of these terms tends to zero as n goes to infinity. Let's handle the a terms first. a is the difference between the characteristic function of x and k and this 
quadratic function of xi, which is the second order Taylor expansion of that. Lemma two tells us that this difference is bounded by this term here, xi squared times the expected value of the minimum of the second moment and the third moment times xi over six. Now here's what we'll do. We'll fix any positive epsilon that we like and we'll break up this bounding term by where the random variable xnk is less than or equal to epsilon and absolute value or greater than epsilon and absolute value. And now we will approximate each of those by a different one of the minimizing terms in this bound. For the first one, we'll take the cubic term. Now, we didn't make any assumption that x was in L3, but we don't need to because in this term, x is bounded by epsilon. In the second term, we'll ignore the cubic part as we have to, unless we knew that x was in L3, and just use the L2 estimate. So that gives us this estimate here, where for the first term, what we've done is to note that x cubed is less than or equal to epsilon times x squared. And for the second term, we've just written down what we had above. Now for this first term, we may as well now bound further and ignore this, because what we've got left here is just sigma nk squared. So that means that we've bounded a n k by xi cubed over six epsilon times the sum of the sigma nk squareds over the nth row, which is just equal to one, plus xi squared times this. And notice that this sum, by the assumption of Lindbergh's condition, tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So that shows that the limb soup of this sum as n goes to infinity is less than or equal to c cubed over six epsilon. We showed that was true for all epsilon greater than zero, and therefore this limb soup is actually equal to zero, and so the limit is zero since it's a sum of positive terms. So that shows half of what we need to get the Lindbergh central limit theorem. Now we need to show that the sum of the b's goes to zero as well. But that's just a matter of calculus because bnk, the thing that we're summing, is just the difference between this exponential function of xi squared and its first order Taylor expansion as a function of xi squared. And you can prove very quickly that the difference is less than or equal to the next term in the sequence for a positive u. That's an exercise for a first course in calculus. And therefore, the sum of these is less than or equal to the sum of one half of the square of this term, which is just a quartic function of xi, which is fixed, times the sum of the fourth powers of the sigmas. Now, we have normalization conditions on the second powers of the sigmas, but what do we know about the fourth powers? Well, not a lot, but that's okay, because we can just write the fourth power as the product of the second power twice, and now we can just bluntly estimate one of those by their maximum. So that shows that the sum of the bn's is less than or equal to this quartic function of xi times the maximum variance along the nth row times the sum of the variances along the nth row. The sum of the variances is one, and the Lindbergh condition implies the decaying variances condition, which states that that tends to zero, and that concludes our proof of the Lindbergh central limit theorem. Lindbergh's version of the theorem here allows us to deal with some ends that are not identically distributed. They still have to be independent though. It's natural to wonder whether there are any real situations where it's necessary to have a theorem that gives normal concentration for a sum of independent but not identically distributed random variables that nevertheless satisfy an average uniformity condition like the Lindbergh condition. We'll check out such an example in the next lecture.